from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell in London. I'm Brett Sprigg at the ABC in Sydney. And I'm Sunil Gupta for Akashwani in Delhi. Wonderful to be with you all in a moment. We're going to get to know Australia's newest World Cup winning captain, Pat Cummins, a little bit better by talking to an old teammate who knows him well. And boy, that is because Australia are on top of the world. After seven weeks and 48 matches, the Aussies did the seemingly impossible, turning up at India's showpiece stadium, playing the hosts who were unbeaten throughout the tournament and silencing a crowd of over 92,000 to win their sixth 50 over World Cup title and they won a canter really six wickets and no jeopardy by the end I will get into the nitty-gritty of the match in a moment but uh, first of all Sunil and Brett um, your reactions Sunil let's briefly touch with you in India to start with because all the expectation was there wasn't it how, how did you um, sort of consume the match and everything that you followed the tournament you know throughout and, and then I guess the aftermath yeah, well, um, as I said, one's a bit numb, you know, at this. Uh, it's not a feeling of, you know, devastation. It's not a feeling of, you know, I'm going to go and jump in the pond or something. It's nothing of that sort. It's, um, you know, something was bound to happen. I'm not talking about the law of averages. I mean, you know, that's that's bunkum because this is an organic game. This is not, you know, tossing a coin. But um, I do think that, I think we, we just overhyped it a bit. You know, there was just so much hype. And when that happens and the expectations are so high, you know, the, the one thing that comes and it sort of upsets the entire apple cart, and that was this, this was here. And actually what I marveled at, I really marveled at when I was watching, was the sheer professionalism of the Australian team. I mean, they had lost the first two games to India and to South Africa, and South Africa by a whopping margin, and then came back and beat them. Uh, in the semifinals and now in the finals. And that is the champion side. And that is a side that really believes in professionalism. I'm not saying that the Indian team did not play well. It played incredibly well, better than I thought. I mean, to bowl World Cup teams out for under 100 and other teams for just over 100, England and you, you name the other two that came under Sri Lanka for, for you know, to, to uh, you know, out by 55 or something. But as I, th as I said... You know, the thing that everybody expected this, this was going to be the, uh, you know, the, the, the big moment in our lives, the, the big moment, moment in Indian mm. crowning moment. You know, it was preordained. You know, it could not be anything else. You know, everybody else was going to bow to the altar of Indian cricket, and it doesn't work that way. So I think there was a little bit of both sides. But at the end of the day, whatever you may say, you have to admire the professionalism. And they were there. You know, I read this article which says something about Australianism, you know, and that is what came to the fore in this particular game. And I think there is a meaning to that word, you know, when you just you know, grind it out. And that's exactly what they did. And you have to admire them. What about you, Brett? They're in the, the land of the happy fans. <laughs> yeah, quite weak here. Look, initially, uh, it's always hard to have perspective on this, but with the benefit now of four or five days since it happened, it was the best of their six World Cup wins. The fact that it was this culmination of a long tournament, seven weeks, 11 games, coming from a 0-2 and two start, and the final itself was typical of the campaign. Pat Cummins' decision to, to bowl first, it was seen as very bold, just like their decision to only have one spinner in the squad and to pick Travis Head when he was no guarantee of making it back in from injury. All of these things would prove fruitful in the end. And Travis Head played an enormous part in rising to that occasion, didn't he? Player of the match, 137 from 120 balls, uh, becoming only the seventh player to get a century in a World Cup final and the third Aussie after Adam Gilchrist and Ricky Ponting. And that blinder of a catch as well to dismiss Rohit Sharma, the India captain, when he was on the cusp of a half century. Uh, that felt really pivotal. But Brett, as you mentioned, he missed you know, the first five matches with that broken hand, but it also roared back to get the player of the match in the semi-final as well. Um, you know, he, he is a superstar now, isn't he? And not just of Australia one day cricket, because you also think back to his recent test performances, in particular, the World Test Championship final at the Oval, only in, back in June. 
his reputation now across all formats as such a pivotal player. Um, if you look at, as you say, his recent test form, the big hundred against India in the World Test Championship, he was consistent in the Ashes, didn't score a century there, but was still Australia's third highest run scorer. He was player of the Ashes, the previous uh, Ashes series in Australia. Uh, he's been opening in T20s as well. Uh, came within nine runs of a maiden 100 in that format only recently against South Africa. But he has the game suited to, I guess, the timeless 50-over cricketer because he also he does have a sort of a controlled recklessness about the way he plays. He's fearless. There was always a perceived weakness against spin bowling, which is why he was dropped during the test in India earlier this year, but showed his wares there as well. Um as a left-hander, he was a big fan of Adam Gilchrist growing up, and some of his defining knocks were in the one-day format as well, including in a World Cup final in 2007. So that inspiration is obvious. And now, as he approaches 30, he turns 30 uh, during the Boxing Day test, he's at this stage of his career where a lot of cricketers say he's usually the most plentiful as far as form goes. That's the cricket side of things, Ali. But I think what people love about Travis Head is he kind of has this, and excuse the silly cliche, but he's almost like this Aussie boy next door. He just looks and sounds I know like what a you lot mean. of ordinary <laughs> Aussie blokes. He, he, he loves a drink, uh, obviously, but he, he sort of presents as the kind of guy that we would want as a teammate in our local cricket team. I think that's what Australians love about Travis Head. And do you think, Brett, on the, on the flip side then, the Australians, this team, 2023, are being fettered in a suitable way? Are their achievements rightly being lauded as, as right up there with some, some of those other greats of the games and, and those players who have won multiple World Cups? Because you look at those who, you know, won in 2015 and are still here in 2023, your Warners, your Smiths, your Mitchell Starks. I think as far as the history goes, Ali, this, this being their best World Cup victory, I think everyone accepts that as to whether it occupies the same place in Australia's psyche overall. We've had in the past ticker tape parades uh, for, you know, returning uh, World Cup winners across all the sports and, and cricket certainly have had their fair share of, of lauded um, heroes as in heroines. But, uh, well, there's a couple of things I suppose getting in the way. One is this T20 series that's that's happening yep. as we speak. Well, it happened which after is... T20 World Cup, didn't it? When England yeah. won and then we're playing a series. Absolutely. But it's funny, there's an acceptance that, yes, this is a big achievement, but... As to our own, I guess, whether we whether one day cricket still occupies the same uh, place in our hearts and minds, as has been an ongoing conversation for many years in cricket fans all around the world, not just in Australia, I think that pulls back a little bit on the celebrations. That, hey, this was a fantastic achievement. Uh, will it happen again in four years' time in the future of that format? It's a whole other conversation, but it's it does feel a little uh, less, which is uh, unusual given it is such a, a huge achievement this time around. Well, also on last week's show, we spoke in depth about the performance of some of the captains at the World Cup. And the final really did show the class of the Australia skipper, Pat Cummins. From calling the toss correctly, bravely choosing to bowl first, and then not conceding a boundary during the 10 overs that he bowled. And he dismissed Virat Kohli, remember, as well. Uh, Brett, now that Pat Cummins has got home, um, he's been talking about the team's legacy. But was this his finest outing in an ODI? Well, only since his extraordinary double century partnership with Ben Maxwell <laughs> a fortnight prior, Ali. Um, as I said, ODIs don't endure in the memory in perhaps the same way they used to, but it's hard to remember a better performance um, for Pat Cummins and to do it while captain. I mean, there is so much noise, not just in that stadium, uh, but inside your head to work out where to go next, to get on top of the changing position of the game. And even when it looked like that India on the ropes, you're still, I guess, strategizing how the game remains on your terms because God knows India have enough guys who can put the game back on their terms. But yeah, I look at all of that, the fact that he himself is an all format player with such a workload and between the rigors of test matches and the lightning fast nature of T20 to conduct a spell like that across 10 overs is really special. And to do it in a final as a leader of that team, even better. Well, somebody who knows Pat Cummins very well is former Australia fast bowler Trent Copeland, a teammate of Cummins at New South Wales and somebody who I commentate with on Channel 7 in Australia as well. Trent, welcome to Stumps. How are you doing? I'm going very well. Thanks for having me. I feel honoured to be a part of it. <laughs> We're pleased to have you on. Uh, tell us about Pat Cummins then, the man you know. What is he like in a changing room and behind closed doors? Yeah, a really interesting one. And what I want to start by saying is what an incredible 18 months uh, as the leader, you know, thrust in there amongst the Tim Payne staff, the, you know, at short notice becoming Australian captain is not an easy task. So, you know, the achievements in the last little while, quite astonishing. 
But then I, I really want to throw into that, that he is the same guy that I met when he was 17. Right now, amongst all of the stuff that's been going on, you know, the Johnny Bairstow, Piers Morgan calling, you know, every name under the sun with this Australian cricket team. And the heat of battle, still having a smile on his face, whilst still being the best bowler in the world, largely, has been remarkable to watch. But he has the ability to be himself in press conferences, laugh at things that, you know, average people laugh at. He's a very relatable kind of guy. Um, and that's the thing that I love as a, as a teammate, as a mate. Uh, I've been lucky enough to be there along the way for a bit of the journey. And at the outset, I mean, I presented him with his baggy blue down in Did Hobart. You? And then, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, normally it's legends of the game that present baggies. Uh, Paddy got a bit stiff with me having <laughs> to present his. But, um, you know, that a special moment for me, you know, in, in that moment. But we all saw greatness straight away. So it's special play up, but now I'm so thrilled that Australia and the cricketing world are seeing Pat Cummins, the person and the leader within that changing room, because when he speaks, it's got cut through, people listen, and he just carries that gravitas and that aura that great leaders do. Copes, you speak of those interpersonal qualities that cricketers have, and anyone that's ever met or had interactions with Pat Cummins knows how likable he is. I think even in the outer sanctum, most Aussies, most cricket fans worldwide like what they see in Pat Cummins and the way he carries himself. But not every cricketer who's a nice person has leadership qualities. Has the Pat Cummins you know always been a, a, a leader, a prospective captain of Australia? Have you always seen that in him along the journey? Yes and no. I mean, the the no answer comes from just how great a bowler he was from the get-go and how important he was to that facet of the game, which often doesn't lend itself to captaincy. But everything else, yes, absolutely. Always had the ability to sit within the spectrum of whatever's being discussed, whether it's at domestic level, from an ACA board perspective, the Players Association, or bigger picture issues within the game, the ability to have context, understand what's most important, and then move forward with what's a practical solution, always been a feature. Uh, He's a country boy, beautiful family. And what's maybe been a little lost within all of this is the tragedy that he's had to deal with in his own family, uh, losing his mother, uh, beautiful lady, and uh, just that family unit. Um, is such a beautiful unit. So, look, it's uh, no mean feat what Pat and this team have achieved, but when you throw all of this stuff into the mix, we're talking a special human being that we're very, very lucky to have playing the game that we all love, firstly, uh, but to call a mate and a, and a teammate within Australian Network. And as you say, you're always proving yourself as an Australian cricketer, as an, as an Australian captain as well. And it's, I mean, look, he won the Ashes, of course, and then uh, two summers ago, then the World Test Championship, the Ashes again in the UK, which is always hard to sort of retain the Ashes there at least. But even during this World Cup again, to lose those first two matches and the pressure is on again, how did you see his captaincy develop specifically across this tournament in India? Oh, Spriggy, I don't, I don't know how to put this into words, the, the magnitude of what the actual leadership gut feel decision-making from not just Pat, but also Andrew McDonald for things like picking Travis Head in the squad where he's injured. That, that, how often have we seen in the last two years, maybe even longer since Justin Langer was um, replaced by Andrew McDonald, that George Bailey, Tony Dottermade, the leadership groups, including Pat Cummins, are making gut feel calls that can go awfully wrong and you're not able to really quantify why you're doing it that have gone so right for Australia. And, and that's the thing that sticks out is when people are getting gut feel calls that are seemingly risky to the rest of us, right so often, there's good methodology, good process and really good people. I was talking to Ed Cowan about it on the Grandstand podcast uh, earlier this week. And that's the thing that really stood out was um, Ed pointed out when I was talking about this sort of stuff that it's really the person's character in this that sticks out and Pat is a great example of that, but also guys like George Bailey and Andrew McDonald.
I heard you and I heard, you know, Brett talk about uh, Pat Cummins, and I must tell you, I'm a great admirer of his. You bowled with uh, Pat, uh, been tandem quite a number of times for New South Wales. What did you both learn from each other? Wow, this is interesting. I mean, I learned, I learned that he was him. He was it, as the kids say. Uh, and I learned that I was not. <laughs> uh, you know, I was Very a insightful. lover of the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I learned that I was a lover of the game. And in actual fact, our bowling styles and execution were very similar in that we both, at the outset of our first class careers, both tried to swing the ball both ways. And Pat started to go back and embrace that a little bit in recent times, bowling that big in swinger again. Um, he just had about 25 Ks on me uh, and, a, and a bit more raw ability. Um, but you know what? We played that debut match together. Um, but a few games later, a prelude to sort of Pat's test career starting over in South Africa was the, the Shield final where... Ed Cowan put on a bit of a clinic against us and we both bowled a truckload of overs. And what I learned from Pat was that pace doesn't mean that you can only bowl short spells. Pace and skill and raw talent doesn't mean that you are anything. You can be whatever you want to be. So um, he was just, from the get-go, an amazing talent. I, I learned a lot from him in humility um, and in the later years when he was already an Australian cricketer and the number one bowler in the world, coming back, giving back to young players, not just playing the game and trying to excel, but having an awareness set that, okay, this bowler needs this from me right now and this is my skill set that I can offer him so that our team collectively is uplifted. So, yeah, I mean, I could talk for hours about Pat, <laughs> but there are a few of the things that stick out. Trent, it's been a real pleasure having you on. Uh, Pat Cummins always strikes me as somebody who has a, a, a quite a deep understanding of self and whether that's come partly from his journey of, you know, that test debut in Johannesburg, but then the injury and all those years out before coming back to building his body up, being strong. And the captaincy in this last 18 months has been truly extraordinary and not least the death of his mum in and amongst that, which I think, as you said, has largely been sort of lost a little bit, but such a huge personal uh, event that he's gone through and it really gives an added deep context to everything that he's achieved so wonderful to be able to get your insights Trent thanks for being with us on Stumped it's Trent Copeland former Australia bowler and of course New South Wales teammate of Pat Cummins well that was all we've got time for on this week's Stumped for Akash Varney don't forget you can follow us on X we're at BBC WS Sport and use the hashtag BBC Stumped and check us out on YouTube as well go to the BBC World Services YouTube channel you'll be able to watch us there thanks to Sunil Gupta and to Brett Sprigg see you again next week bye bye